get turned is next week we have our final exam in biology B. Oops. Hold on. There we go. So the final is going to work pretty much just like the midterm. Only instead of only being over half of the term, the final will cover questions from everything from the very start of the term until now, essentially. So today is actually going to be the very last day of notes. So we're not going to go any over any new material next week. Instead, we're going to be reviewing on subjects from across the term. So the final is going to open up on Monday. That's December 14th. And it is due on Thursday, the 17th. So you have all week next week to work on and turn in the final exam. Again, it's extremely important that you get it turned in on the 17th because that is the last day that you can turn in any of your work. If you don't get it turned in and you try to turn it in to me on Friday, the 18th, I'm gonna say, sorry, I can't take it. You're gonna get a zero on your final. And that will not be good, no matter who you are. So it opens on Monday the 14th. It's due by the end of the day on Thursday, December 17th. The good news is that the final exam is the only thing that we have going on next week. So like I said, our Tuesday and Thursday classes are essentially just going to be review sessions of the stuff that we talked about in the first half of class, going all the way back to DNA, copying the DNA, making the mRNA, making the proteins out of the mRNA, dividing the cell either by mitosis or meiosis, genetics, how those chromosomes and how that DNA is passed down from parents to offspring using those Punnett squares. And then the final stuff that we talked about with evolution and the stuff with some figures and cladograms that we're going to go over today. All of it will be on the final, and so we'll be covering all of it during Tuesday and Thursday of next week. So to make things a little bit easier on you guys, the assignments for next week are all simple questions about the term, things what topic did you enjoy the most? What topic did you think was the hardest? What do you most want to review for the final? Is there anything that you would suggest to change about the class for making it a little bit easier for future online class takers to deal with? Those are the kind of questions that I'll be posting for your homework and for your daily assignment. So super simple should only take you a couple minutes a day so you can spend the rest of the time reviewing the notes and working on the final exam. So that is kind of what we got coming up next week. Final, open on Monday, due by the end of the day on Thursday. We'll be reviewing for the final on Tuesday and Thursday during class time. And then we have some simple daily assignments just to make sure that you're checking in and getting that daily attendance credit. Right. Does anybody have any questions so far about the final exam or what next week is going to look like in biology class? No, sir. No. All righty. Mm -hmm. So with that, we're going to move on to our notes for today, which have to do with a type of scientific graph known as a cladogram. So a cladogram is a type of scientific graph or picture showing the relationship between different groups of animals. So it's a way that scientists are able to show how closely are certain groups related to each other how closely are certain species related to each other? How close are certain families or certain orders related to each other? 
all of that can be shown through what's called a cladogram. So today we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about kind of what cladograms are, but most of the time we're going to spend on how to read them, how to answer questions about what the cladogram is showing us. So the reason why they're called cladograms statistics is the name for the scientific method of classifying animals and plants based on characteristics that they have in common. So the more that they have in common, the closer that they'll be together on a cladogram. The less that they have in common, the more different that they are, the further apart they will be. And so cladistics is what scientists use in order to figure out which characteristics they're going to look at and how it separates the different groups of animals or plants that they're dealing with. And so a clade in science and specifically in evolution biology is a group that includes a common ancestor and all of the descendants of that ancestor. So we could have smaller clades like the primates or the felines, the cats, or the canids like dogs and wolves and foxes. They could all be in different clades if we're looking at kind of a smaller level. Or if we looked a little bit bigger, we could look at like mammals versus reptiles versus amphibians versus birds. Those would be kind of different groups. Or if we went even bigger, we could look at things like land animals versus fish versus insects versus sea animals that don't have backbones. And those would be really, really big clades. So clade is just a group of organisms that have some sort of shared common ancestor. Whether that's a really big group or a really small group depends on the clade that you're looking at. So a cladogram looks kind of as it had sort of like this stair step model on the bottom with a whole bunch of different species on top. And then some clades will include the trait down at the bottom that separates out the individuals. So a cladogram is a diagram that shows how closely different species are related based on evolution, based on that change over time that we were talking about on Tuesday. So scientists figure that the more characteristics that two organisms share, the more similar that they are. So they must have only fairly recently diverged from a common ancestor. So for example, on this cladogram, we start off with our group called the lamprey, which is sort of like uh, some semi-boneless eel kind of animal that lives in the ocean. All of these other organisms here, they have jaws. So there's the lamprey, and then a related species developed jaws, and then turned into all of these guys. So that was long, 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 hundreds of millions of years ago. So then we had things like fish and sharks. Some other species developed lungs. So all of these species are a little bit closer related to each other than to a shark because they all have lungs. Newts also have lungs, but all these other species also have an amniotic membrane in their eggs protective layer around their eggs, which makes them different from newts and sharks and lampreys. So then we have the group of lizards, but our other organisms have hair. So there was some common ancestor. One group developed into the lizards. The other group developed hair and then got further separated. So our next trait is losing their tail. So lynx, which is like a type of bobcat, has a 
but chimpanzees and humans do not have a tail. So chimpanzees and humans are the most closely related to each other because they're the only ones that have jaws and lungs and an amniotic membrane in their eggs and hair and don't have a tail. So they're, they share of characteristics. So they must have only recently diverged from some sort of common ancestors. And then finally, chimpanzees tend to walk around on all four limbs, whereas humans are bipedal. We walk around on just our two legs. So how to read a cladogram? Like I said, it's usually this sort of Y-shaped structure where we have all these little connecting points along the line at the bottom, and then all of our different descendant species on the top. Here we have four different evolutionary relatives, four different types of organisms. So down here at the very bottom, of the tree is way, way back in the past when all four of these organisms shared some sort of common ancestor. So at some point, one of these groups branched off and became descendant number one. And then but the other group was still not finished developing new traits. So some trait evolved in one group that made it different than the first group. So this represent when new species are formed, which is known as speciation. So each one of these new groups that develops is a new species that has some sort of different trait than the species that came before it. So these four descendants at the top of the tree are all the most recent descendants from the kind of ancestral species down closer to the bottom of the tree. So we had some sort of ancestor. One group developed into the first descendant. The other group developed some sort of new trait so that we have a new common ancestor right here between groups two, three, and four. They share a more recent common ancestor. But then one group developed into group number two the other group develops some sort of new trait that went to the common ancestor of three and four. But then those guys branched out from each other as well. They form different species by being a little bit different. So current species up at the top and then how close they are on this tree represents how closely related that they are. So this slide does a little bit better job of kind of showing off. So species A, B, and C are all different species, right? They're not exactly the same animal. Otherwise, we wouldn't have them on this graph. So even though B and C are different from A, they still share some common ancestor, which is down here. So B and C are more closely related to each other than they are to species A. But if we go far enough back in time, there is some point where all of these species were directly related or were the same ancestor. So we started off with some sort of ancestor that developed into two new ancestors, one of which eventually became A, and then the other ancestor branched off to become one population of it turned into species B and another population turned into species B. So this little yellow box down here is the common ancestor of A, B, and C. That's where kind of all of these cladogram lines come together. And then B and C have a common ancestor right here. And then B has its own lineage, and then C has its own lineage. So the closer together that they are, the more recent their ancestor is, the more related that they are together. 
And then the least related group, the least related species on a cladogram is called the outgroup. So that's what species A is over here. It is the least related to the other species on the cladogram. So it only shares a common ancestor with B and C way back in time. And B and C share a more recent common ancestor together. So probably the two biggest things, or I should say the three biggest things to kind of take away from this or to remember when you come into contact with the cladogram, like some of the examples we'll be looking at today. The outgroup is the least related group. The common ancestors are kind of the points on the line where the two different species come together. So B and C first come together here. So that's their common ancestor. A, B, and C first come together down here. So that's the common ancestor for all three of them. And then finally, the more close that the two species are to each other, the more recently that they have this split, this diversion, the closer related they are evolutionarily. So the closer those species are, the more similar they are to each other than to the other groups on the cladogram. All right, so I know that's kind of a lot and it's kind of hard to figure out just by looking at like these kind of basic pictures and these A, Bs and Cs. So I thought that we could go through a kind of simple cladogram together and practice reading some of these uh, cladograms and look at some of these examples. So here we have a uh, lancelet, which is like a super ancient type of small fish-like creature. We have a lamprey, we have a tuna fish, we have a salamander, we have a turtle, and we have a leopard. And then at some point, their common ancestors develop either vertebrae, backbones, jaws, four legs, that amniotic egg that we were talking about, and hair. So I'm gonna have you guys help me answer these questions. So feel free to either answer them out loud or put your answer in the chat. So first off, which of these traits is the one that breaks out the lampreys from the tuna fish? Uh, jaws. Mm -hmm, exactly. So lampreys do not have jaws. Tuna fish do. So the common ancestor of the tuna and the lamprey is right here. They did not have jaws. And then one group of its descendants evolved into the lamprey. Another group of its descendants evolved jaws in their mouths. And that group had a descendant that became things like fish. Exactly. What about a the main trait that separates a salamander from a turtle? Romantic egg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the egg, the amniotic egg. Mm -hmm. So salamanders and turtles both have vertebrae, they both have jaws, mm -hmm. and they both have four legs. But salamanders do not have an amniotic egg, while turtles do. All right, if we look to the very end of our cladogram, we have a leopard. So which organism is most closely related to the leopard? Hair. Hair. What was that? Hair. The turtle. Turtle, yes. Precisely. Mm -hmm. So the leopard and the turtle are all they're most closely related. They have the most recent common ancestor. And all of these other species are 
more distantly related than the turtle and the leopard. They're all further away on the evolutionary tree. Exactly. So, so what are the four things that turtles and leopards have in common, according to this cladogram? Turtles and leopards, um, they have four feet or legs. Mm -hmm. um, they have a tail. Uh, mm, they do, although I don't think that's one of the uh, um, mentioned on here. A vertebral column mm -hmm. and jaws. Yep. And uh, amniotic egg. Yep. Exactly. So turtles and leopards both have vertebrae, they both have jaws, they both have four legs, and they both produce amniotic eggs. Mm -hmm. That makes them different than all of the other species on this list. None of these other guys have the same set of traits as the turtle and the leopard do that we were just looking at. So our group, most distantly related group, more closely, species that are closer together, more closely related, are closer evolutionarily. Mm -hmm. And we can figure out the common ancestor by looking at where the lines from two different species connect. So for example, a common ancestor of a leopard and a tuna fish would be whatever guy was right here because this is where the first place, the last place that the tuna and the leopard are connected to each other before the tuna splits off into the fish group. All right, good, very good, good job. All right, some other questions that I wanted to run with you. Now we have a little bit different cladogram. So we have shark, we have ray finned fish, we have amphibians, we have primates, rodents and rabbits, crocodiles and birds, and our traits are vertebrae, bony skeleton, four limbs, amniotic egg, hair, and eggs covered in shells. All right, so first question that you can answer either out loud or in the chat. Which trait separates the amphibians from the primates? Playgram. So our amphibians are right here, and our primates are right here. So what are the, what's the trait or which two traits are different between amphibians and primates. Hair. Mm -hmm. Hair is one of them, exactly. Is there another one? Uh, bony skeleton? Um, not quite. That's going kind of backwards a little bit. So uh. primates are here and primates are over here. Oh, uh, uh, live in water. No, uh, yes. The what? Somebody say it. Oh, she said amniotic egg. Oh, yes. Okay, awesome. Sorry, I have my volume down a little bit. Yes. Yes, that's the other trait that separates them. So here is our common ancestor for amphibians and primates. And so that common ancestor then developed not only an amniotic egg, but also developed hair on its way to becoming primates after the amphibians. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to skip that next one. So on this cladogram, which organism is the most closely related to the bird? Mm. Mm. Rabbit? It's not the rabbits, although you're close. A crocodile? Crocodile, bingo. Oh. So birds are here and crocodiles are here. So birds, ah. crocodiles, share the most recent. So when we compare it to the birds, their most recent common ancestor was with the crocodile group. So out of all of these species list, the crocodiles are the ones that are the most closely related to birds. All right, now I have a tricky one for you, which is not written down on here, but we were talking about the primates earlier. So which species, which group is most closely related to the primates? Um, probably the crocodile. Oh. Not quite. So here are our primates and here are the crocodiles. And so to connect the primates to the crocodiles, we have to go kind of follow these lines. So here is the oh. common ancestor of primates and crocodiles. So is there a different organism that primates have a closer common ancestor with? Yeah. Uh, Paola said uh, rodents and rabbits. Yeah, awesome. Oh, sorry, I'm switching back and forth between the notes in the chat. So yes, Paola, exactly. So primates and rabbits and rodents are their common ancestors up here. So they are actually more closely related than any of than the primates are with any other group on the list. Like Noberto was saying with the crocodiles, here is where their common ancestor is, further down on the cladogram. So the primates and the rodents have are the closest to each other on the cladogram. So they are the most closely related organisms. Uh, all right. Over the for now. All right. So that is how we read a cladogram if one has already been created for us. About if we want to make our own cladogram. So in order to do that, we first have to identify some characteristics that are different between different groups of organisms. So let's say we wanted to compare the lamprey, a snapping turtle, a tuna fish, and a bullfrog. So our lamprey was sort of our super primitive species. A turtle is a type of reptile, tuna is a type of fish, and bullfrog is an amphibian. So the characteristics that we're going to be are, does it have a nerve cord, like a spinal cord? Does it have paired legs? Does it have a vertebral column? Does it have bones that protect its spine? And does it produce eggs that are in an amniotic sac. So for our nerve cord, all of these species have a nerve cord. All right, so if, even if you're a little lowly lamprey or you're a big honking snapping turtle, you have a cord going along your back that contains the little neurons that'll help you with your brain. Next, if we look at species that have legs, 
rays do not have legs. They're like little eel looking things. Snapping turtles have legs. Tuna fish, no legs on tuna, only flippers. Bullfrogs do have legs. Next up, if we look at a vertebrae column, so like a spine, um, bony spine, lampreys, no bony spine, they just have the little cord and that's it. But snapping turtles have a spine, tuna have a spine, and bullfrogs also have a spine. And then finally, if we look at their amniotic sacs, lampreys do not make eggs with those, turtles do, tuna, do not, and bullfrogs also do not have amniotic sacs. So, from this diagram, let's take a look at how many traits each species have. So, if we look at the lamprey, how many traits that we counted does the lamprey have? How many X's go in the lamprey's column? One. Yep, just the one. They just have a nerve cord and that's it. What about our snapping turtle over here? Four. Four, bingo. And our tuna? Two. Mm hmm. And what about the bullfrog? Three. Exactly. So one, four, two, and three. So based on this, our lamprey is sort of the most primitive, the most basic of the species. It only has one trait. Next up would be our tuna. It has, in addition to the nerve cord, it also has a vertebrae. And then our third most uh, derived species is a bullfrog. It has a nerve cord, vertebrae, and legs. And then finally, our most complex species is the turtle. The turtle has a nerve cord, legs, a vertebrae, some vertebrae, and it has that amniotic sac. So from basic to complex, we have lamprey, tuna, bullfrog, and snapping turtle. So, if we were to make a pedogram of our own, and actually, hold on, let me do that with you guys here really quick. Kind of draw it out for you. This guy, this guy, and this guy. So remember, the lowest on our cladogram is going to be the one that has the least amount of shared traits. So like the lowest number of traits. So which one of our species had the fewest traits, the lamprey, the turtle, the fish, or the frog? I use the lamprey. Mm -hmm. So the lamprey only had the one trait. Mm -hmm. It had just the nerve cord. And then which species had the nerve cord, the spine, but no legs or amniotic egg. Uh, it was the one right next to the lamprey was, um, the no, not the turtle. 
Um, we... Yes, Paula, nailed it. Tuna. So the tuna does not have legs or an amniotic egg. So then which species had the three traits, the cord, the spine, and the legs, but not the amniotic egg? Turtle. Um, was it the turtle or the frog? Turtle. Ooh, sorry, Nuberto, Paolo's got it correct again. So the frog <laughs> had the three traits. Frog was our number three. And then if you remember, the turtle had all four. So the turtle had the... I can write them in. So they've all... We were to write in our traits kind of down here. They all have the nerve cord. And then lampreys have a spine, but everybody else does. Tuna fish do not have legs, but frogs and turtles do. Frogs do not have that amniotic egg, but turtles do. So, Everything has a nerve cord. The lamprey doesn't have a spine, but tunas, frogs, and turtles do. The lamprey and the tuna do not have legs, but frogs and turtles do. And the lamprey, the tuna, and the frog do not have an amniotic egg, but the turtle does. So that's how we can create our own cladograms just by looking at the shared characteristics of a few organisms. You figure out which organism has the fewest number of shared traits, and that goes at the base of your cladogram. And then whichever one has the next fewest goes next, and then the next fewest goes next. Whichever organism has the most number of traits goes at the top of the cladogram. So the lamprey had the fewest traits with one, so it's at the bottom. The turtle had the most traits with four, so it is at the top. All right, so let's do one more example on here. And this time, we're gonna do a similar thing, but kind of change around how we look at the traits. So at first glance, this might look really similar to the cladogram that we were just working on. But you may notice one main difference is that now we have the traits across the top and the species down the side. So the way that you read the cladogram is basically the same, but it shifts around a little bit. How you might count up what has traits and what doesn't. So now, instead of our X's telling us how many traits each group has, instead what they are telling us is what is the most common trait and then what is the least common trait. So we have a lynx, which is like a type of bobcat, a chimpanzee, a lizard, a newt, and a human. And we're going to be looking at 
if they are bipedal, if they walk on two legs or not. Do they have hair? Do they have a tail? Do they have an amniotic egg? And do they have lungs? So if we look at our lynx, which again is like our bobcat, walks on four legs, so it's not bipedal. Lynx has hair. Lynx does have a tail, so it's not tailless. And it has the amniotic membrane and it has lungs. Chimpanzees. Chimpanzees have hair. They do not have a tail. They have that amniotic egg. They have lungs, but chimpanzees are not bipedal. They do not walk on two legs. They mostly walk on four. Lizards, not bipedal, do not have hair, have a tail. They produce amniotic eggs and they have lungs. Newts are not bipedal. They don't have hair. They have a tail. They do not have an amniotic membrane. So the only thing that they have is lungs. And humans are bipedal. They have hair. They do not have a tail, they have a membrane, and they also breathe using lungs. So again, these X's down, these counts down here at the bottom don't necessarily show us which groups are the, have the most or fewest traits. Instead, they show us which traits are most common versus least common. So based on our counts down here, what is the most common trait? What trait do all the organisms have? Lungs. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Everybody has lungs. Precisely. What is our second most common trait? Amniotic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, the amniotic membrane. Common. What about our third most common? Hair. Hair. Mm -hmm. Precisely. And then Hello. what's the next most common? No tail. Mm -hmm. And then what is the least common characteristic to have? Bipedal. Bipedal. Mm -hmm. It's basically the fancy science way of saying walking on only two feet. So yeah, exactly. There's only one bipedal organism that's humans, but all five of our organisms have lungs. So that's great to know about kind of our simple traits to our more complex traits. But what about if we want to make our own Platogram. So remember, when we're doing, when we're looking at which species is going to go, we want to start off with the species that has the fewest number of shared traits. So which one of our species over here on the left is the most basic, has the fewest number of our traits? The newt? The newt, exactly. If you look, the newt has a whole bunch of blank space, and lungs are the only shared trait that it shares with all of the other species. So newts would be our first one. I would, actually, I might, actually, I don't. Right. Oh, I can't. would go there. What about up next? What is our second Lazard? species that has like the next most common traits? Lizard? The lizard, exactly. Lizard. lizard only has two shared traits. They have lungs and a special membrane. What about who's next? Who has third most? Shared traits. Chimpanzee. Mm. Let's see. Chimpanzee has one, two, three, four. Lantix and Lanix. 
the Lynx. Lynx has one, two, three yes. shares. Lynx is up next. And then, Noberto, you were pretty close. It has four share traits. Next. And then finally, which group has the most number of shared traits? Human. Humans. So the newt only has lungs. The lizard has lungs and the special membrane. The lynx has lungs, the membrane, and hair. The bee has lungs, membrane, hair, and does not have a tail. And has lungs, membrane, hair, does not have a tail, and walks on two feet. Even though we switched the sides that the traits were on compared to earlier. So up here we had the species across the top and the traits along the side. Down here, even though we had the species along the side and the traits along the top, we were still able to put together our own Instagram based on starting off with our out group, our group that is related, has the fewest traits, and then saying, okay, who has the next most traits? Okay, who has the next most and the next most? And then finally, who has the most number of these shared traits? So that's how we can put together our own cladogram based off of making this chart of species have which of these traits. All right. I know those guys are a little bit tricky, but does anybody have any cladogram related questions? Anything that you want me to talk about again or show off again? No. No. All right. So I did the last thing that I wanted to show you regarding cladograms was some of your homework questions, because the assignment for today is all about knowing how to read and look at cladograms. So the first couple questions are pretty straightforward as a sort of basic nondescript cladogram. And is asking you to say which of these five species is the most closely related to species number two right here. And which one of these species is the outgroup? Uh -huh. So that's the first two questions on the homework deal with what is the outgroup and what is most closely related to species number two. The next cladogram is a little bit different than some of the previous ones that we've been working with. So instead of being like this one where everything is facing up, this one is a different version of the cladogram that basically has just turned everything on its side. So it's still the exact same setup and the exact same ideas that are closer together on the cladogram and that means they're more closely related to each other. And then you can find the common ancestor of two species by looking at where they are on the cladogram and then following their lines back to where they started. So for example, the species Pan paniscus and pan troglodytes are very, very closely related. You can see that their most common ancestor is really, really close. They're right next to each other on the syllograph. But on the flip side, Hylobites lar and Macaca mulata, even though their names are next to each other on the cladogram, if we follow their lines, they're not 
directly connected to each other. They don't have a common ancestor until way back here, because this is the last place where we can go one direction and get to Ulata, or the other direction and get to Hylobides. So same basic principle as this type of cladogram, only now it's turned on its side. So the specific question is asking you, which one of these, which two of these species are the most different? So it gives you some different options and says out of these four options that we've given you, which two ones show the two most differently related, most distantly related species? Which ones are the furthest apart according to this cladogram? This one is another slightly differently set up cladogram, but it still is asking about for species C and species E, which of these numbers represents their common ancestor. And then number five is exactly what we were just doing by looking at the organisms and looking at the traits. So we have our little cladogram, our blank cladogram down here. And I want you to tell me based on this little chart for number five, Is A going to be mosses, pine trees, flowering plants, or ferns? And same thing with what is B going to be, what is C going to be, and what is D going to be? So each of these species fits somewhere on this cladogram. And it's your job to tell me which species is the most thick and primitive which species is slightly more complex, which species is slightly more complex, and which species is the most derived, the most complex, has the most traits from our chart earlier. All right, so not too many questions, only technically five questions, but it's really testing you to kind of test your ability to read and follow the relationships within different types of cladograms. Does anybody have any questions about cladogram or the cladogram homework? No. Well, if not, but you have questions later, please always know that you can reach out to me, send me a text, send me an email, leave a comment on the Google Classroom, and I will do my best to get back to you as soon as I am able.